and screenwriting is third person present tense, all right? Uh, fade in, interior, passenger train excursion car, morning. As the credits roll, and Doris Day in the freshness of her youth warbles out sentimental journey, the sounds and rhythms of the train clicking along the tracks gives counterpoint to the music as the screen flashes images of the countryside, tinted by nostalgia and by the ancient passenger car's windows. Small farms and fields spread out in the valley, green and lush with summer growth. Farmers atop combines busy themselves with harvesting early oats, and the world seems filled with promise. The train is a 4th of July special, making its way from the city to the holiday hullabaloo that happens once a year in the countryside. Noisy celebrants peer out through the 40s style passenger car windows sipping on the latest vintage that springs from the fields and the small vineyards of the valley. Children, armed like demolition experts, carry bags filled with bottle rockets and other illegal explosives, busy their hands, filling the void of the countryside. A graying middle-aged man in a sport coat sits alone, staring out the window. In the distance, the low mountains that separate the valley from the ocean stand as sentinels and voiceless judges over the val valley. The train winds along a river that leads back to a community nestled against the hills. A grain elevator topped with an American flag is the tallest structure on the horizon. The river slices the town in half and is joined at the middle by a single steel span. The train pulls into the station at the center of the small town. Passengers gather their things and quickly exit. A middle-aged man stands up, picks up a canvas shoulder bag, and walks down the aisle and off the train. Exterior, Sheridan, noon. A crowd lines the main streets of the small town, waiting for the parade that once a year fills the streets, their streets and their lives. Old folks sit in chairs. Children pull at their parents' legs to buy them balloons and fireworks sold by the street vendors. A police car drives by slowly, flashing its lights, directing cars to detour from the parade route. Mike watches momentarily, and then... Cut to exterior, Sheridan, 1950, afternoon. A crowd not much different from the current one lines the streets of Sheridan. The style of dress is different. The street vendors hawk different items, but the atmosphere is much the same. Grandpa and Grandma Morgan sit in wooden chairs along the main street next to the tavern. Grandpa sucks on an Italian stogie. Marky and Mikey sit beside them. Marky gets up and pulls on Mikey, gesturing to him with his hand. Head. The boys slip through the crowd. Cut to interior, treehouse, afternoon. A match spurts, flaming up. Marky, muffled. Come on, get it out. Cut to interior, church, afternoon, minister. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Cut to in interior of the treehouse. A fuse is thrust up to the flame, dancing nervously near, but not touching the flame. Marky, give it to me. Interior church, afternoon, minister. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Interior treehouse. The fuse flares up, burning quickly toward a cigar-sized firecracker. Mikey, throw it, throw it. The fuse burns quickly. When it is within an inch of the firecracker, a hand throws it deftly and accurately down and through the open window of the church. Cut to interior, church, afternoon, minister. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There is a deafening explosion and rattles the windows of the church. Smoke fills the room. A choir of screams fills the church. Cut to exterior, Main Street of Sheridan, afternoon, 1950. An explosion rocks the street, rattling the windows of the buildings as a blank load from a military howitzer fires. <coughs> Uniformed soldiers in chrome steel helmets clear the weapon. The spent brass clangs to the street. A billow of smoke obscures the weapon. Crowds along the street clap and cheer. A policeman pulls Marky and Mikey over to where Grandpa Morgan sits watching the parade. A military honor guard marches past. Grandpa Morgan stands and salutes. The policeman lets go of the boys and salutes. Marky and Mikey snap a Cub Scout salute. Policeman, Mr. Morgan, Mr. Morgan. Yes, Lewis. It's Marky and Mikey again, sir. Yes? We caught, him, caught them throwing a firecracker. 
It's a 4th of July, Lewis. <laughs> through the window of the Mennonite church. So, in the middle of the service, anyone hurt? No, sir, but they certainly scared hell out of those poor people. Isn't that what sermons are about, Lewis? <laughs> this ain't no laughing matter, sir. Do you remember my son Marcus, Lewis? Of course I do, sir. He was in the Normandy invasion. I heard he'd seen a lot of action over there. In the first wave, I heard it was real tough. Marcus pitched baseball in high school. I knew he played a lot of ball in school. He pitched two no-hitters his senior year. He was a fine athlete, sir. On that June day in 1944, he pitched a grenade through the opening of a Jerry pillbox that had his company pinned down. He was a fine soldier, sir. Grandpa Morgan tapping his cigar. Training, Lewis. Training. Sir, you can't let Marky and Mikey Grandpa Morgan puffing on his cigar and turning to watch the parade. Train. The policeman stomps off, mumbling to himself. Marky and Mikey move in close and clasp both arms of Grandpa. Grandpa Morgan shaking his head. Train. A crack army drill squad twirls silver plated Springfield rifles in the street in front of Grandpa Morgan and Marky and Mikey. Marching in close order drill, their silver helmets gleaming, their spit polished boots clicking on the pavement. And that was a scene that I wrote. Right, for, uh, um, originally, the way I uh, looked at this, I was going to have two main characters, twins, Marky and Mikey, and they were both born uh, December 7th, 1941. What day of the week was that? <laughs> Sunday. So, thus I had Sunday's children, all right? So then, um, in about 2000, when I retired, I, I, you know, I'd worked with William Stafford for a number of years, and he had a habit, when he was a conscientious objector, when he first went into CO service, uh, he, was, he was a poet. He was in graduate school at University of Canvas, Kansas, and he, uh, he was writing poetry. And of course, uh, they, the CO service took up there full time. He was working on... on out of uh, Santa Barbara, California, up in the mountains there, doing a lot of work. But every morning, he would get up at 5 o'clock and write poetry for two or three hours. And it became a lifelong habit of his. Uh, later on, he told me, when his children were born, he had uh, two daughters and two sons, that they would start getting up with Dad. They wanted to get up with Dad at 5 in the morning. So Bill said, well, I started getting up at 4 o'clock and doing my writing. So when I retired, I decided, well, I'm going to try to try to do what Bill did. So every morning, I would get up at 5 o'clock, and I started Sunday's Children. I started writing every day. After about six months, I had my first draft of the thing. And of course, that was in 2003, I think it was. And I just sort of put it down. And, went on making documentaries and eventually came back to it and, and finished it on the thing. So, all right, I, w I would like to read, I want to read part of the first chapter to you, if, if you don't mind. This, now, this, one thing I did, one reason I wanted to write a novel is because screenwriting is third person, present tense. It's, so, it's impersonal. It's like a big, you know, it, it's like uh, some sort of, uh, draft that you have and that sort of thing. Nobody takes screenwriting seriously, for one thing. They think screenwriters are a bunch of hacks, which is probably true. I think with a lot of the film they turn out, it, it, they are hacks, but uh, once in a while there's a great screenplay. But I got so tired of writing in the third person that I, I wanted to write the novel in first person. So the two models, of course, teaching, I, I taught both of these books. I started with Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, you know, and, and with Huck telling the story. And of course, Ernest Hemingway, I, you know, this is something I quoted to my students when I was teaching, said, that all modern American literature comes from one book by Mark Twain, Huckleberry Finn. And of course, Hemingway is a bit hyperbolic, but, uh, you know, I, I agreed with him. And the other book, the other one that, that influenced me a great deal was The Catcher in the Rye. How many of you have read Catcher in the Rye? All right. You know, it was banned from a lot of, a lot of schools, and they're still trying to ban Catcher. But 
the, the young narr narrator, uh, Holden Caulfield, is, is amazing. So that's what I wanted to do with, with my novel, is try to get this voice that is very strong and really comes out. All right, let's see if I did it. Chapter one, Grandpa. I can see him now in his long sleeve white shirt with garters holding him up, wearing a tie and dark brown fedora, and dress flax, chewing on a long black Italian stogie and swearing under his breath as he swings the double-bladed axe with authority, splitting the planar around in half. Ha! What a picture he made in 1944 from my mother's Hawkeye Brown in Canberra. In the first place, who chops wood wearing a tie and a white dress shirt and in a fedora? And he's still doing it. He's out there right now like he's Zeus, dividing the universe into firewood chunks. Only now he's looking for me to do his chopping, calling, Stevie, where are you, boy? I need you. 1944, when the photo was taken, he needed his sons who were off to war, four of them. One was a medic in Europe, another a GI in the Philippines, a third a truck driver in the U.S. Army in Greenland, and a fourth a shipyard worker in Portland building Liberty ships. And the funny thing is, they all came back, all four of them fools. Can you figure it? Luck, I say. If only my father had had such luck. Stevie, get over here. I see him coming in in the pantry, and I try to duck out, but before I can exit, he has me by the back of my shirt, dragging me outside. He looks at me over his dark, furrowed eyebrows, his wrinkled, bare face. Get out there and chop, chop your grandma some wood. I looked him in the eye, and I knew he meant it. Gee, Grandpa, it's a holiday, and there's a parade coming. <coughs> Start now. There's plenty of time before the parade, and when you get done there, take a load of kindling to your grandma for the kitchen stove. He handed me the axe and strode off like Zeus on a mission, preparing to pounce on some unsuspecting lady in the neighborhood. Maybe that's why he dressed as he did, chopping wood. He never knew when a nice looking lady would saunter by on her way to the store or something, and he always wanted to be ready. I chopped wood for a while until I was sure Grandpa wasn't watching, and then I walked around the two-story monstrosity he calls the house, toward the old barn where Zeus kept his old car junk. In the shadow of that dilapidated paintless fire trap is where Grandma and her girls planted their depression garden and later their victory garden during the war. Did I forget to tell you? Zeus, uh, there were all, all, excuse me, there were also six girls in Zeus's lair and none of them went to war unless sleeping with every soldier and sailor they could drag to bed counts. They did their part for the war. I had to write a composition for class once about what my family did in World War II, and old man Nelson had all the kids in class read their compositions aloud except me. He asked me to stay after class and asked me if what I wrote was the truth, and I said, if anything, it was less than the truth, and that my aunts were patriotic sluts, and that my mother was the worst of all, and I never saw Nelson get so angry. He grabbed me by the collar, the veins in his neck sticking out, his face shaken and said, listen, the war did strange things to people. We've never had anything like it in our history. And then he paused for a moment, relaxing his grip on me, placing one hand on my shoulder. I'm sure you have a good family. Try to understand them. And here he paused for quite a while. Try to love them. And with that, he tore up my paper and threw it in the wastebasket. I liked old man Nelson. First of all, he'd been a real soldier in the war, Marine and Tarawa. Iwo Jima, though, and he didn't mess with the guy. I'd seen him take a wise ass and push him up against the wall like a drill sergeant, bark at the tough guy until the kid broke down in tears. So I told Nelson I was sorry about calling my aunt sluts, and that yes, I really did love my mother, even though she slept with other guys while my dad was away at war getting shot and killed. But maybe that was okay, because she was a woman and my mother. So I was about to run for the railroad tracks of freedom when this big black caddy screeches to a stop in front of the house, almost hitting me. And who steps out but Mother, dressed like a second street whore in a flamethrower red dress with enough makeup on to outfit Patton on my night maneuvers. I could tell she'd been drinking by the way she wobbled when she walked. Honey, what you doing in the middle of the street? I shrugged and turned and started to walk away when he got out of the Answer your mother, son. It was Cato, the latest. I'm practicing the march in the parade today. All I need is a rifle and a helmet. You got one? Cato took two quick steps 
toward me, but Mom stopped him and put her arms around me, hugging and kissing me, smearing lipstick all over my cheeks, reeking of booze until it almost took my breath away. I'd had enough wounds for two purple hearts after that skirmish. <laughs> you going to the parade with Grandpa? Sure. Cato was my, was my least favorite of all the boyfriends Mother had brought home. He was a cocky son of a bitch with wavy black hair and gold fillings in all of his teeth. So many you needed sunglasses when the bastard gave you that toothy, leering grin of his. He was a jippo logger who gambled, fought, and fornicated with anyone and everyone. And every year, when the new car models came out at the car dealership in town, he and his brother would walk in and lay down a wad of cash and order two new black Cadillacs. And the bastard never did go to war. F and four effort. Said he had a heart murmur. Know what he does in the woods? He's a tree topper. He has one of those straps around him and he climbs to the top of a tall tree on a point, cutting all the branches as he goes. Then he tops the SOB and tree while he's on it. And the top goes careening down, making the tree sway like a huge earthquake just hit. And he's up there swaying back and forth with that toothy, leering grin of his. And the doctor said he couldn't go off to war. F and 4 F S O B. I shot the breeze with my mother for a while. She asked me questions about me and my sister and how we were doing, and if I was watching her and all. Oh yes, I forgot to tell you. I have a younger sister, Jenny. She's a prize. She has the prettiest blonde, silky hair, color my mother's used to be before it became platinum. When she was just a tiny baby and my mother was nursing her, my mother took off with one of her boyfriends for two weeks, and there was no one to feed Jenny. Grandma was frantic. Ginny cried for two weeks with nothing but a bottle to suck on and some mush Grandma forced down her. And then, when Mom came back, acting like it had only been an hour since she left, she wanted one of the neighbor's ladies to adopt Ginny. Grandma had a fit. She took after Mom with a stick of stove wood, and Mother picked up Ginny and went screaming into the living room where Grandpa was reading a newspaper, trying to hide behind him. And Grandma kept screaming, put the baby down. Put the baby down. Well, I was ready to see Mom get hers, but Grandpa stepped in and stopped me. Mother and Cato went into the house, and I walked across the street through the Standard Oil Company tanks and across the railroad track toward Jimmy Joe's house. Jimmy Joe's my best friend. He lives behind the Mennonite Church just a block off Bridge Street and a block from the Anne Hill River. Jimmy Joe's Native American. The river is named after the tribe of Indians Jimmy and his father is part of, his family is part of. Jimmy's great-great-grandfather signed the treaty paper at Shampooey that gave all the Indian land away to the whites and put the Indians on a reservation 10 miles from our town. The Indians have been damned unhappy ever since. Jimmy Joe's father, Billy, celebrates his unhappiness by drinking as much beer as he can every day at the Riverside Tavern. And then he comes home late at night and celebrates some more by beating his wife and kids. He works once in a while when he's not in stupor and can make it to the plywood mill five miles up the road from our town. Jimmy Joe says he wasn't always that way. In the war, he was a warrior. And I've seen the photos on the wall. Jimmy says his father has medals st stuck away in a chest in the attic. Jimmy Joe's mother's a gem. I can smell the freshly baked bread coming from her oven half a mile from the house. And she always invites me in to have a slice with Jimmy Joe when I come over. And it seems like she's always baking something good. It's Wednesday, but there's no school because it's Armistice Day. And I notice as I walk through the fields that singing is sifting from the open windows of the Mennonite church. Those people go to church more than anyone I know. And believe it or not, I know a lot of churchgoers. I throw pebbles at Jimmy Joe's upstairs bedroom window that's half open and yell. No reply. Then I see a hand reach out and a firecracker hits the ground in front of me and explodes. It's just a small explosion from one of those lady fingers, but it's, it's enough to scare the bejesus out of me. Hey! Don't you know it's illegal to possess firearms or fireworks in the city limits and it's doubly <coughs> illegal if you're an Indian? His head bobbed out of the window and he laughed that infectious laugh of his. This ain't a city and my great-great-grandfather was drunk when he signed that treaty, so it ain't legal. <laughs> Come on down. It's Armistice Day. We gotta celebrate. We aren't veterans and I'm not celebrating any holiday that has anything to do with a general that took our land and made us slaves. Your father's a veteran. Yeah, that's right. If we wake him up, he's going to start another war. I've got to tell you, our town is named after this Civil War general, General Philip Henry Sheridan. 
We have a statue of him purchased on his favorite steed, Rimzai, in the city park. He was actually out here in Oregon in the Willamette Valley, another Indian name, when he was a young, cocky cavalry second lieutenant. They were called dragoons back then. I read this stuff in the li city library. It's up above the fire station across the bridge. Anyway, Sheridan was just out of West Point. He didn't get along in Texas where they first sent him, so they sent him out to the west coast, first to California, then to Washington and Oregon. He corralled some Indians in the Yakima Valley and then became commandant of the Indian Reservation just up the road from here, where all of Jimmy Joe's relatives were kept. In our city park, there's also a blockhouse made out of all these old logs with openings about every six feet apart and, and leading to a, and, well, where they stuck out rifles and there's long stairs leading to a second story door that has bars on it. We fought many a battle there. Jimmy Joe says he was, this was the Fort Hill jail where his great great grandfather was in prison when he led a strike refusing to do slave labor for Sheridan and the other government officials. He used to sit on the reservation at Old Grand Ron, not far from the Catholic Church, where Father Crockett taught Jimmy Joe's people how to read and write and pray in English, reading the Bible. The town, the people in our town call it the Phil Sheridan Blockhouse. And sometime early in this century, the founding fathers of our town decided to move it to our city park. I'm glad they did. But Jimmy Joe wants to burn it. He keeps trying to get me to help him torch the thing. Jimmy Joe came down, and we decided to walk down Sheridan Road to see if Denny was home. The town was preparing for the big parade. All along, Bridge Street banners were being hung honoring Phil Sheridan, and on every street corner, an American flag flapped, more than I'd ever seen before. Jimmy Joe thumbed his nose at a photo of Phil Sheridan displayed it in the Hass drugstore as we walked by it, and I saluted it just to irritate Jimmy Joe. He faked a punch to my belly, and I grabbed him around the neck and squeezed until he said, Uncle. Then he lives a couple of blocks off Bridge Street in an area that was once called Germantown. They changed the name to Sheridan Road during one of the World Wars, probably the first. Denny Smythe's family came from Germany, but during the war, Denny's father was a combat ph photographer, and we always tried to get his father, George, to show us his photos he shot in combat in Italy, France, and Germany, every chance we get. Once in a while, Denny persuades him to show them to us when he has time. He owns a local photo studio in town. And he has some really great stuff, but then he says his father has all these other gory photos with guys with their heads blown off and their guts hanging out, stuff that he keeps hidden in the basement. We want Denny to look for it. I knocked on the door and Denny came out dressed in khaki army fatigue, sporting a steel helmet that belonged to his father. The helmet was so large he couldn't tell who was under it. In his hands was what looked like a 30 caliber carbine, but really it was only a 22. Then he pulled the helmet back on his head, and then pulled back the cocking hammer and locked the chamber of the rifle open, shoving it forward. Weapon, ready for inspection, sir. I grabbed the carbine and looked at the breech and down the barrel and slapped the rifle back in his hand. Very good, soldier, I said. We howled. Where's your camera? In my pack, sir. Jimmy Joe walked around to Denny's pack, opened it, and pulled out a big black camera with a sight on top that Denny's father had carried during the war. This camera has dust on it, soldier. Jimmy Joe blew dust off the camera, juggling it from one hand to the other. Don't drop that. Dad would kill me. <laughs> Denny was always carrying a camera with him, no matter where he went. He carried it around to school, to P.E., during lunch. He even took the damn thing with him to the laboratory, for Christ's sakes. We accused him of shooting dirty pictures in a lab, and once the principal called him to his office and asked him about that very thing. Denny was always getting in trouble, and he was always innocent. We loved it. Come on, we're going to pick up Lawson and go to the fort. Denny took off the steel pot, put the carbine in the hall closet, grabbed his fatigue jacket, and walked out of the house, closing the door behind him. What you got planned? Denny was always asking questions like that. He was always nervous about our plans because he was afraid we'd get into trouble. Oh, nothing. Let's go get Lawson. You going to the parade? Sure we are. That's at 1,300 hours. Then you're not planning something special. Jimmy Joe has ordinance. Ordinance? Ordinance, military man. Jimmy Joe pulled a wadded up sack out of his jacket and opened it, showing Denny some of his cash, cherry bombs, and blockbusters. God, where'd you get all that? Who said the Indians don't have special privileges? My old man got him on the reservation last summer, and I just found him last night. My dad would kill me if I did something like that. If your dad was an alcoholic, he wouldn't remember me. 
we walked back to Bridge Street where the volunteer firemen were still putting up the parade banners and watched Mr. Hunter huffing and puffing on a fire truck ladder, trying to hook a banner on one of the wires. What you doing, Mr. Hunter? He turned around, almost falling off the ladder. Huh? Oh, hello, boys. You coming to the parade today? Sure are. We wouldn't miss it. That's good. Make sure you salute when the flags pass. Yes, sir. We will. Mr. Hunter was also our Boy Scout troop leader for Troop 162 in Sheridan. We always laughed watching him sweat and strain whenever we took a hike with him. He must be 200 pounds overweight. He was in the Army during the war, but we couldn't imagine him making a five-mile hike, let alone a 25-miler with helmet, pack, or rifle. It took a stretch of the imagination. We laughed a lot about it when we talked about him after our meetings. He was a good guy and all, but definitely not the, the soldier or the Boy Scout type. And speaking of types, Ken Stanford came walking down the street just then, carrying a book as usual. His mother wouldn't let him join the Boy Scouts because the uniform looked too much like a military uniform. <coughs> Pussy kid. He was friendly and all, and a very smart guy, but always when he saw us coming, he would cross over to the other side of the street. Hey, Ken, what you doing? Oh, nothing. On your way to the library? No, library's closed today. That's right, it's the holiday, Armistice Day. I know. Your dad coming to the parade today? Oh, no, I don't think so. How about the rest of your family? Your mom coming? No. How about you? We'll save a place for you right in front. Oh, no thanks. I have schoolwork to do. And with that, he turned and walked away. All the guys laughed. I noticed Mr. Hunter was watching me over his shoulder, still teetering on the ladder. Joke was that Ken Stanford's father was a damn CO of World War II. He was drafted and refused to go into service, but somehow got CO status. That's conscientious objector status for those of you who don't know. Stanford didn't even belong to one of those churches that say they don't believe in war. Makes me so mad. So anyway, Ken's father, Bill, served four years in what's called the civilian public service where he had to clear trails and fight forest fires and like that. Too easy. I read in the library where some of the guys refused to work and they sent them to prison. Serves them right. I would have locked them up and lost the keys. Ken's mother was the daughter of a brethren minister. That is one of the religions that believe in nonviolence and turning the other cheek, or so they say. She met Ken's father while he was out cutting brush and fighting fires and wooed and wedded and bedded her right there and made a pacifist kid while he was still cutting brush. And none too soon, either. We're going to need brush cutters for the next war. Damn COs. Ken's father is a professor of English literature at Linfield College in McBinville, just 12 miles up the road toward Portland, and his mother teaches at our school. All the guys have tried to stay out of her class. We don't want a pacifist for a teacher. Earlier this year, one of the teachers asked Ken's father to come and read poetry at our school, and he did it. We had a big assembly where all the upper grade classes got out of, grades got out of class and principal introduced him and all, but I didn't go. I got sick. I told Mr. Nelson I was dizzy and I felt like throwing up. Then he got this funny look on his face and told me to go to the lab and then report to the school nurse in the office. I don't think he believed me, but I wasn't going to sit there and listen to no pretty words or propaganda from the pacifist poet. And that's exactly what Grandpa said about it. It was propaganda perpetuated by pinko communists. After the assembly, all the guys told me old man Stanford's poetry wasn't so bad and that he didn't use pretty words or rhymes and that they almost understood some of it. I had to remind them that Stanford, of Stanford's CO status in the war, and they said maybe the poetry was pretty awful after all. Well, Mr. Nelson handed out copies of some of the poetry that Bill Stanford read at the assembly and tried to get the class to talk about it, but I just put my hands over my ears and refused to listen. Mr. Nelson saw me and asked me if I was still ill, and I said yes, and I might throw up at any moment. So he sent me back to the nurse's office, but she wasn't there. I hung around for a while until the lunch bell rang, and then I was about to dart out the door. Mr. Nelson came in. He asked me if I felt better. I told him, yes, I feel much better. Thank you. Then he looked me in the eye and asked me if I was really sick, and I had to tell him the truth. Then he asked me if I had an aversion to poetry, and I said, mostly, or maybe just some poetry. And then I blurted out, I wasn't going to listen to no poetry written by a pacifist poet, and nobody was going to make me, period. Well. 
I could see Mr. Nelson was wild. He was getting in his lecture mode. So I quickly told him I had to get some food in my stomach because the doctor said I was anemic and I might faint at any moment. He looked at me sternly. All right, go to lunch, but I want to see you in my room right after school. I don't think Mr. Nelson would do much to me because I thought he believed the same things <clears throat> my grandpa and I did. But you never knew about Nelson. Sometimes the old fart surprised all of us in class. I told the guys at lunch about my meeting with Nelson. They agreed he wouldn't do much. He couldn't. He was a veteran. He'd been a jibrating. <clears throat> the guys suggested I should remind him of that somehow in our meeting. Give me a second here. So after school, before I went to Nelson's room, I stopped off in the band room and borrowed one of old man Baloo's trumpets. i have been playing in the band for two years. So I marched down the hall playing the halls of Montezuma that I'd learned in the first year band, stepping smartly all the way to Nelson's room. I noticed the door was wide open. And just before I got to the room, I played the cavalry charge that I picked up from watching John Wayne Westerns. <laughs> I stopped playing and put the horn down to my side as I entered the room. Mr. Nelson hadn't even looked up, so maybe he'd lost some of his hearing from being so many artillery attacks in the war. But his hearing appeared damn sharp at times in class when the guys and I were whispering to each other, Sir, I'm here. Yes, I see, and here. Oh, you heard. I think the Marines hymn is one of the finest pieces of music ever written, sir. I got so damn tired of drilling to it, I'd be happy if I never hear it again. What about the cavalry charge? I despise horses. Sheridan wouldn't have been a successful general if it hadn't been for the cavalry, sir. That's true. But that was a different time and a different war. Fifth Cavalry is fighting in Korea right now, sir. Well, they are, huh? How do you know that? I saw it in the newsreel, sir. The Marines and the cavalry are pushing the North Koreans all the way to Manchuria. They figure the war, the police action, will be over by Christmas. Don't believe everything you see and hear in the newsreel, son. Yeah, but we've got General MacArthur. And didn't he return to the Philippines and win the war in the Pacific? Perhaps, along with the U.S. Navy and the Army and the Marines and the Army Air Force and the hundreds of thousands of soldiers and sailors and Marines and two atom bombs. You know what I mean, sir. Yes, I believe I do. Your heroes are military men who fought for this country. Your villains are those who, because of religious affiliation or other strong beliefs, refuse to fight. Is that correct? You can't tell me that you believe in anyone refusing to serve. If all of you had done that, where would we be today? Ruled by Hitler and Hirohito. Mr. Nelson looked thoughtfully at me. I knew I'd scored some points. He got up and started pacing back and forth between the rows of desks, and then he sat down again. I fought in the war because I believed in this country, and I fought for my buddies in the foxholes next to me, and so did a lot of other guys. So did my father, and he died for what he believed in. But your father would probably all say it, so say if he were here, that he fought to preserve freedom and the right to express one's opinion and ideas without being persecuted. How would you like to live in this a country that, where you could be shot for expressing a belief counter to the government. I wouldn't. Well, that's why you should listen to Mr. Stanford. Even though you and I may not believe in his philosophy, we should defend his right to say it, don't you think? I can't stand for efforts and pacifists. Cato's free to cut down trees and drive around in new Cadillacs and take my mother to bed, and Stanford's free to walk around and write pacifist poetry and read it to kids who are too young to understand. And my father, who fought and died for this country and his flag, is buried some hole over in Europe, and I'll never see him again. I don't remember what his voice sounded like, and I only remember what he looked like from his photos. Is that fair or right? Tears came to my eyes, but I bit my lip and got up from the desk. Mr. Nelson offered to give me a ride home, but I didn't feel like riding, even with him. I got out of the room as fast as possible and walked home without my coat, books, and without my bike, but still carrying Mr. Ballou's trumpet. When I got to the top of the hill overlooking town, I blew taps, and several dogs began howling. An old man carpenter came outside and yelled at me, stop the racket. Ah, that's... <laughs> That's um, one of the things, well, any comments or questions? Any questions?